CSS Working Group Update webinar. I think we have a very good agenda for today's session. Um, I just want to have a few housekeeping items before we jump into the presentation. So we will be taking uh, questions uh, at the end of all of the presentations. If you do have a question, please feel free to type it either into the chat box and ensure in the chat box that if you're sending it to the organizers and panelists only, or depending on what you're seeing in the GoToWebinar um, control panel, you can also type your questions into the question box. And again, we will be answering all questions uh, at the end of the session. If we do not get to your question, we will follow up with the response after the webinar. And um, as this webinar is being recorded, it will be posted on the FUSE website, FUSE.eu, for uh, future viewing. So without further ado, I'm going to turn this over to Chris Decker to perform an introduction. And as everyone knows Chris, I don't really think he needs an introduction. Okay, great. Let me get this started. So again, as I will reiterate what Scott said today, uh, welcome everyone. Um, we hope that this will provide you some uh, good information about some of the, the neat things that are going on within the CSS working groups. Uh, we have a number of case studies today, but I'm just going to start by giving an overview of what this is about, um, what FUSE is about, what the working groups are about, and sort of what our goals and mission are in this initiative. Um, so I call this sort of the experiment in, in collaboration. Um, the goal of bringing people together to work on things, uh, whether they be problems and challenges that we face or new and innovative ideas that we want to try to uh, see if they'll help to improve the product review and, and development process. So to give a short background on Fuse, uh, Fuse is the Pharmaceutical User Software Exchange and we're a global group of programmers, statisticians, and data scientists throughout the spectrum. Um, we're vendor neutral, inclusive, and open. Uh, that's an important thing for our organization and for everyone who's involved uh, is to really be open to um, all ideas, all individuals within the space, and to tackle these, these topics that we face within our, our jobs and within our processes. Our mission is to provide a platform for creating and sharing ideas, implementing tools and standards around data, and exploring innovative methods and technologies. So it's bringing people together to share this information. And we do this in a, in a plethora of ways uh, from our conference, our computational science symposium in March to our annual conferences in October to over a dozen single day events that we hold uh, globally throughout the US, Europe, India, China, and Japan, uh, as well as online uh, activities uh, such as the Fuse Wiki and other wor and working groups. So to talk just quickly about sort of the paradigm shift um, from uh, the kind of the, the FDA stands there and sort of uh, tells us what they want and we wait for that, that preaching from up on high to an environment where we really have everyone who's involved in this uh, activity of delivering drugs to market, delivering products to market, uh, involved in in the process, and involved in the discussions and solving the puzzles that we that we face, and this could be FDA, CDIS, CROs, academia, anyone that that's uh, affected by uh, the things that we do every day. And the goal of this, the working groups and the co annual computational science symposium, is to really bring these people together to work on these problems. So the mission of the, and I won't read this word for word, but the mission of the Computational Science Symposium and the working groups that continue to do their work during the year is to really provide a forum, a collaborative forum, in a transparent and non-competitive way to bring people together to talk about the computational science needs, whether it be data, process, or technologies, to support the, the product development and review process. So how can we bring people together to really have this discussion uh, both from industry and academia or, or the regulators. So right now we have uh, these working groups and um, we have the annual conference in March and we had it this past March and are already in our planning stages for next March. But as um, part of that is the working groups, the groups that are out there uh, doing this, uh, these projects and this work and we have a, a steering committee which sits in the middle and their goal is to really oversee these working groups 
and make sure they're aligned with um, their projects across groups, across other organizations, uh, such as CEDIS and Transcelerate, and to make sure we're, ne we're all kind of moving in the same direction. There are five groups that we currently have. Uh, one is optimizing the use of data standards, emerging technologies, um, a semantic technology group, a non-clinical roadmap and implementation, and a standard scripts for reporting and analysis. And today, in our presentations, uh, we'll be showing you some case studies of projects within these working groups. So these working groups are basic uh, high-level concepts of areas of interest. And then within each of these groups, there are a number of projects that individuals and volunteers are working on uh, to, uh, to improve processes and work on uh, challenges that we face. So what, what are these working groups? Um, they're about implementation. They're working on best practices for standards and technology and process implementation. Um, discuss and summarize these challenges within, within the implementation. It becomes an incubator, trying new ideas with technology, for example, semantic modeling or cloud-based implementation. It's really a, an area to incubate and come up with new ideas and try these, try these ideas. Um, test and provide feedback on new standards and processes. And to really provide an open forum for sharing ideas across the FDA industry and other organizations. And to hopefully provide a platform, whether it be in the form of a wiki or a code library or, or other sources, for sharing this information um, within the working groups and to uh, industry and other, uh, other stakeholders in this process. What the working groups are not, and this is important to kind of communicate this, um, we are not, the working groups are not about policies. We're not creating or defining or recommending any policy or guideline changes. Um, and this is important for uh, us to continue to have collaboration uh, from FDA and other organizations is that we're, we're in a, a non-policy, non-competitive environment um, where we're just providing feedback and input into the topics that we're discussing. Um, we're not defining standards within these working groups. CDS, HL7, and other standards development organizations, it's their responsibility and their objectives and goals and mission to create standards. Our goal is to, to use those standards, tackle some of the implementation, um, you know, gaps, challenges around maybe some of those, and the best practices around maybe how to use those, those standards. So our focus is on the implementation and not the development. Finally, to do this in a in a um, open and, and non-competitive environment, that this isn't a place to market technology. This is a place to have open collaboration, uh, maybe develop um, you know open source or free tools uh, for for help with various things, uh, but to do it in a non-competitive way. So that's sort of I wanted to give a short introduction to the high-level mission and goals of the working groups. And now I'm going to hand it back over to Scott, who's going to walk you through uh, a number of, or is going to facilitate a number of other individuals who are going to present on a number of project case studies that we have. Thanks so much, Chris. So for our, our first presentation, um, Susan Kenny is going to talk about a project in the optimizing the use of data standards working group that um, put together an analysis data reviewer's guide package. Susan Kenny is a biostatistician and programmer with over 20 years of experience in the pharmaceutical industry. 15 years ago, she was fortunate to get involved with CDISC and was an initial member of the ADAM team, as well as a past ADAM lead and ADAM trainer. She has worked in both small and large size pharma companies and is now an independent consultant specializing in CDISC implementation and submission standards. So thank you, Susan, for coming today and uh, presenting on the uh, ADRG. Thank you, Scott, and thank you, Chris. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Great. All right, well, thank you, everyone, for being here, and I hope I can impart some knowledge about one of the work streams that completed this year, um, the Analysis Data Reviewer Guide team. First, a little bit about background. Um, you know, over the past number of years, m most sponsors were developing something that they called a reviewer's guide that would go in with the submission and provided kind of an orientation to the data that was being supplied with that submission. 
um, but there was no standard for the content or um, or structure of that document. And, you know, the sponsors did a quite a wide variety of things with respect to how much information was in a reviewer's guide. So uh, FUSE and, and FDA saw this as an opportunity and um, a gap that could be filled with a working group. So first let me just introduce the, the concept of a reviewer's guide. Um, the, the purpose is um, to be able to document decisions about mapping uh, that a sponsor might, might have had to make um, implementation decisions with respect to SDTM or ADAM, um, any kind of sponsor-defined conventions, be it controlled terminology or um, structuring different data. And you know, the defined.xml is a, arguably a very important document in a submission, but there isn't really any place in the defined file to express this kind of high-level, um, overarching implementation type uh, information. So it's um, the reviewer's guide is, is where this kind of information could be placed and allow the reviewer to kind of get a, an overview of the data um, before they embark on actually using it, to know, you know where the issues are, if there are any, et cetera. Now I also like to always help us keep in mind that many things that we develop um, with FUSE or, or CDIS standards, you know, they're not really just for um, an external reviewer. Uh, I like to think that sponsors can profit by developing a reviewer guide in-house as a, a study is ongoing because it's a way to organize information that is important for the project that otherwise might get lost or buried in emails or meeting notes, et cetera. So it's, it's a way that a sponsor hopefully can keep track of important things at, during the lifetime of a project and then at the end of the day have a reviewer's guide that um, is close to being ready to be submitted with the data. So in, in the from a reviewer's perspective, it could be treated as, um, as a living document. So with that said, um, two years ago, one of the very first work streams that was in the optimizing the use of data standards was to create um, what is called the study data reviewer's guide. And the focus of this reviewer guide is the tabulation study data. Um, and on the heels of the completion of that work stream, we started a, a second work stream last year, which is to essentially do the same thing um, and create an analysis data reviewer guide, which of course the focus is on the analysis data. So um, these two guides uh, were created based on the assumption that CDIS standards were being used. That is, SDTM for the study data and ADAM for the analysis data. Um, however, you know these guides we feel are flexible enough that if you're not using um, CDIS standards, you can still use um, much of these templates that we've created um, with some adaptation. So they're flexible enough even if you're not using CDIS, but. We base this on the assumption that you know more and more sponsors are, are going full tilt with SDTM and Atom, and it just made sense to um, to make that assumption for for these um, reviewer guides that that's what sponsors would be using. We get the question quite a bit: is like, why are there two reviewers guide? How come there isn't just one? And I agree that there is some logic. Um, in having one document, um, but my understanding is that the reason we have two is because the reviewer guide needs to be located in the same ECD folder as the data because there may be some linking going on between the reviewer guide and the defined and or the data, and so they all need to be in the same location. And given that we have two folders, one for tabulation and one for analysis, 
that means we therefore have two reviewer guides. But given that these two work streams um, were back-to-back uh, -back and some uh, folks uh, were on both teams, it's, I think there's quite a nice harmonization between these two reviewers' guides and they're, they're designed uh, to be complementary and to be used together. So let's concentrate specifically on the uh, Analysis Data Reviewer Guide, or ADRG. So on the FUSE website in the Optimizing the Use of Data Standards page, you'll find a zip file uh, with a May date, and that was our um, final deliverable package. And in that package, you'll find um, three sets of documents, um, an ADRG template, uh, completion guidelines, and then two examples. So I want to walk through those um, documents. So the first of these is just, it's a template, just a word template, essentially blank, but it has standard sections and standard headers. And so this will help uh, all of us organize the information in the same location so that a reviewer knows where to look for a given topic. Now some of the sections are required, um, many of them are permissible. So if you have that particular uh, issue, then you would, uh, you know, you're permitted to, to use that section or vice versa. You can not have anything in there if it doesn't apply to you. Now with some, within some of the required sections, there are a few questions that are required to be answered. And I'm not going to itemize all of them here today, but one of them is, were unscheduled visits used for any analysis? So the intent of this question is the answer it should be fairly simple, yes or no. You might direct them to, yes, they were used in efficacy, but not in safety, or vice versa, whatever. It's not meant to repeat a lot of information that might be in the stat plan or the final study report. Um, we make a big uh, emphasis of that in the ADRG that, you know, we we don't want to duplicate information you can find other places and cause a, a bigger burden for the industry to have to manage the same material in multiple documents. But so, but having an answer, a simple answer to an important question, again, helps orient the reviewer um, to what they can expect when they open up a data set. And many of the sections are expandable past these required um, questions and allow the sponsor to put in whatever information they feel is important for that section. The completion guidelines is the second document, and this is actually a very important companion document to the template. So the section headers are identical, but then the completion guidelines um, provide discussion and examples of the type of information to provide to that section. Um, for example, the, the template itself is only seven pages long, but the completion guidelines is 27 pages long. So you can see how we spent a lot of time in the completion guidelines going into a lot of detail about, you know, what should be presented in that section, uh, things to think about, food for thought. Um, so this really is a, an important document that goes along with the template. And then we have two fully worked examples. The first of these, we were very happy to be able to use the reworked CDIS pilot study to create an ADRG. And what's nice about this is that um, the user community, um, you have access to the actual data for this pilot study and the defined file. So now we have a true end-to-end -end package, um, SCTM, Atom, define tables and an ADRG. So that's a, a very nice end-to-end -end that you can trace all of those pieces uh, from one to the other. The second example was from a real study, um, but of course it had to be anonymized and no data is available, but, but it's still very descriptive and useful. So first I just, uh, you know, just some suggestions. Um, if, if and when you start to adopt the ADRG, you know, start with the template document, okay, the blank document, and fill in the sections as you need, and use the completion guidelines uh, to help direct 
but not dictate your content. And, and that's very important. Again, we have a lot of text in the completion guidelines. It's made to be there for things for you to think about and to guide your content, but not tell you what to do. Um, if there's no information for a given section, for example, if you don't have any intermediate data sets, then our recommendation is that you leave that section header in there and just indicate not applicable or we don't have any intermediate data sets or whatever. And that um, means that the section numbers are all going to conform across the industry um, for all reviewers guides uh, as opposed to being renumbered. All right, so let's um, just take kind of a, a quick look at the ADRG. There are seven sections in here plus an, a, an appendix. And uh, my intention is not to go through each of these, but I just kind of wanted to give you an idea of, of the content. The first two sections um, are, are very similar to what's in the SDRG. And yes, there is a very little bit of duplication of information, but it hopefully is not going to be too painful to um, to maintain. So we have a uh, protocol description and then this section analysis considerations related to multiple analysis data sets. Um, again, these are things that might apply to um, across the board. The intent here again is not to duplicate what's in your SAP or your final study report, but just to call out some important things. So one thing I would like to just um, focus on first is this one section about the protocol design in relation to Atom concepts. Um, we know that um, in the Atom model, the concepts of things like analysis phase, analysis period, treatment periods, these are central to Atom design. Uh, but it isn't always easy for a, a user to discern how these concepts were defined and applied to the data that's being analyzed for a given protocol. Um, if you have a simple protocol, it's simple. But if you have a difficult protocol with um, numerous treatment periods and rescue arms and follow-up phases, it, it can be quite complicated. So we advocate that um, at, the, at the least you describe in text, OK, you know, here's my protocol. It's a, two-arm, double-blind, open-label study. I've used A period in this manner. I've used treatment in this manner. I'm using treat CP, blah, blah, blah. And I'm using A phase um, to help um, identify phases of the trial. So again, this is just an example uh, in text. Or alternatively, you could do the same thing by taking the uh, protocol schema that's in the protocol. It's usually a picture uh, in, that shows the phases of the trial and the arms and the length of time, et cetera. And you can annotate on there, um, you know, here are my phases, here are my periods, and I've used these values of treatment, et cetera. So in a quick snapshot like this, you know, the user can get a, a fairly good idea of how you're implementing um, the Atom model with respect to the protocol design. The next section I just wanted to highlight was this one, comparison of SDTM to Atom content. Um, from the feedback we heard from reviewers, um, it indicated that a common source of difficulty for them is um, when there's differences between SDTM and Atom. For example, why don't I have the same number of subjects in ADSL that I have in DM? Uh, why are my why are my baseline values different? You know, how come I don't have the same number of records in vital signs, SDTM and Atom? So, uh, you know, this section is a place to highlight those differences that might trip up a reviewer if they're trying to, um, you know, actually do analysis from the SDTM. And obviously, we want to focus on the differences here, and not not the similarity. The next uh, section, um, the first of these, the, the fourth section, is many of these are permissible, but just allows the sponsor to talk about data set creation, file dependencies, variable name conventions that the sponsor might have used. Um, and then section five is um, about each 
about the individual analysis that, and then lastly, a conformance um, summary if, run, if you're running open CDISC or, or ha you might have your own conformance checks. And just to be able to highlight, you know, if there were any issues with conformance, you can discuss them there. Just want to talk about this section five because it's probably the, um, the meatiest, if you will. In this section is just the idea to give an overview of what's being submitted. And this can be done in a table form that I'm showing here or in text. Um, so certainly in the define um, on the data set level metadata, you would have a list of all of the data sets. So again, we don't want to duplicate that information, but this is really to give a very quick snapshot. You just put an X or a check mark in these um, columns, whether a data set you know, contained efficacy or safety data, um, was it PKPD, does it contain the primary objective, et cetera. Now, some of these are expandable. You can add additional ones. Some of them, like structure, is uh, permissible. If you don't want to repeat the structure that's in the defined file, you don't have to do that here. But the idea here is that you give um, an inventory of the analysis data sets that are being submitted, all of them, and then you would hyperlink um, if you needed to provide more information for a given analysis data set you would hyperlink that to a, a next section in this section five. And we always um, are requiring a section for ADSL, just to be able to really highlight and explain what's in ADSL, what are the important variables of interest. Um, and then as needed, you would add other sections for analysis data sets. So, you know, perhaps you want to have um, a little bit of description about your data set used for primary efficacy and call out, well, what, what are the values of param that you, that are being associated with that primary endpoint? Are there specific analysis visits that are more important than others, et cetera? Again, it's not meant to duplicate what's in defined, but rather provide that information in a, in a little in a more uh, coherent manner. So this ADRG has been out for about four months, um, and I am grateful to the folks at Pharmastat, uh, John Brega and Linda Collins specifically, who've really been using this ADRG wholeheartedly. And in using it, we've we found a couple bumps, um, largely related to formatting. Um, this word template is is a template. It has uh, automatic numbering in it, and there's just been a couple wrinkles with respect to um, how those headers are formatted and what happens if you copy them, et cetera. And there are some minor inconsistencies between the three documents, the completion guidelines, the template, and examples, so we want to clean that up. And there's just a little bit of areas of clarification or wordsmithing that you know might be causing confusion. So in the next um, month or so, you'll find an updated version of the ADRG out on the website. Um, but you know, in the meantime, if you've already started to use ADRG, you know, don't sweat. There's nothing that we're going to be doing here that um, is going to be a, a major, major change from what it has been. Um, nor, nor uh, should prevent you from using it right now. So I didn't really talk about the SDRG, um, but I can just say everything I've said about the ADRG really applies to the SDRG, but just from the SDTM point of view. So it, it, that package is very similar, um, kind of similar look and feel, has required sections and required questions, expandable, et cetera. And of course, like I said, the best practice is to try to use both of these documents together. So thank you very much. Uh, feedback is always appreciated if and when you start using the ADRG. If um, something's working for you or do you feel like something's broken, uh, feel free to um, email me or folks on the website that are, are indicated as owners of the ADRG, and we'd be happy to consider your feedback. 
Thank you so much, Susan, for that presentation. That was excellent. And thank you for all of the work for the, that you did co-leading that team and that that team did putting together that, that work package. I think that's, that's a very important um, progress that has been made in, in that space. So I'm now going to hand the presentation over to Troy Smyrnas, and I hope I had his name right, to talk about the SEND implementation wiki and forum. So while Troy keys up his presentation, let me give a brief introduction. So again, Troy Smyrnas is the information architect for the R&D division at Zertis, responsible for the management of the significant information footprint for the division, including database integrations, uh, service abstractions, as well as master data, data standardization, and analytics initiatives. Troy has been involved with the SEND initiative since 2006, where he participates on its leadership team and the CSS non-clinical working group since its inception, where he serves as a uh, co-lead, as well as leading the SEND implementation user group subgroup. So with that introduction, Troy, please walk us through the uh, implementation wiki and forum. All right, thanks, Scott, and, and not a bad job on my name. Uh, not too many of those bad. So I'm gonna talk about the SEND implementation forum and wiki, uh, which are two outcomes out of the SEND implementation user group subgroup of the non-clinical working group uh, working group of the FU CSS. So that was a mouthful, but I'll walk you through some of the history later. So first I'm going to give an introduction, a little bit of history and, and where we are now. Um, then I'm going to discuss how we decided um, how to come across the forum and next go through uh, what the wiki is and a little demo of that. The forum, same thing, a little demo of that. Uh, next, visualization, uh, how to get the word out, and then finally a summary page uh, and, and some links. So a brief introduction, no guide for the guide. Um, back in 2012, uh, there was an implementation guide out for SEND that had been out for since uh, July 2011, uh, but there was nothing really to help people use the guide. Uh, so it was very technically oriented, very detailed, uh, but some of the surrounding questions just simply didn't have a place to be answered. So during the 2012 FUSE CSS, uh, the non-clinical working group identified this as a need, as one of its prioritized, let's make a working group out of this, or subgroup out of this, and we made the SEND implementation user group. Uh, so we went off and did our thing. Uh, in 2013, we unofficially released the wiki uh, with a bunch of pages in 2015. And then in 2014, uh, we put out the official release of both the forum and wiki as a cohesive package. So what goes where? Um, so at the, at the outset, ignoring you know, possible solutions for it, we had two key needs. One was a place for FAQs, just surrounding questions about the guide that don't really belong in the guide but are needed, and then uh, links to various things uh, to help people out. And then the second one was a place to ask ex experts, uh, kind of an active discussion forum. Um, so out of that, uh, they kind of uh, go nicely into two content types. Um, one is the wiki, uh, where it's a great place to store uh, just kind of an evolving knowledge base type of information, great place for FAQs, great place for links, great place to have people land when they don't know what they're doing. Uh, and then the second is the forum, which uh, provides that active discussion, um, a place for people to ask questions. Um, so the, the, the other piece to this is that the two related. Um, so you could easily have a wiki off in one site and a forum off in a completely different site, but the two kind of had to uh, have a symbiosis. Uh, so the forum discussion should naturally lead to new wiki questions. So if somebody asks a good question, we should see that on an FAQ page. And then likewise, people reading the FAQ page might say, I don't have to see my question answered, go to the forum and ask those questions. So first I'll talk about the wiki. Um, so at the, at the outset, we had a number of uh, experts in the SEND field uh, who had plenty of uh, accumulated questions. So for instance, CROs, vendors, who had been getting questions from people and maintaining their own separate lists for these things. So we already had uh, a lot of information that just simply needed to be put somewhere. Uh, so we, we met, discussed some of the pages that we might need, um, and we started working on them. Um, a wiki can be, you know, established or provided to the public at any point, but we decided, you know, what we need a critical mass of the pages so that they're at least useful from the from the get-go. 
you know, these wiki pages are evolving. They can change over time. But at least let's have this core set of pages, one of which, and the most important of which, is the FAQ page. Um, second is that it can be created or edited by anyone. Uh, this is an important one because a lot of the other documents in this space tend to be up on some website that people can't easily modify. And the key with these FAQs is that it has to be more up-to-date, more easily uh, modifiable. And then the second piece is establishing links between pages. Uh, Wiki naturally is just a series of pages that have nothing to do with each other. And so doing things like um, having a structure in mind where we put in links to the other pages so that there's a, a simple uh, intuitive navigation, and then also establishing tags so that anybody who wants to know a particular subject area can see the various pages related to that. Um, and then finally, the management. So there was some discussion back and forth, and, and generally speaking, uh, the best practice for Wiki, uh, unless you have some uh, concerns otherwise, is just to have it be free for all. Um, you know, it, if you have some, you put your tinfoil hat on, uh, you could worry a lot about what what happens if people go in and erase all the data. What happens if people? In reality, this just doesn't happen. Um, People can go in and maliciously edit pages, but there's always a, a trail uh, you can roll back to previous versions. So in reality, it's not really a problem. So it's much easier just to let everybody have access so that they can edit freely. Um, remove some of those barriers that would stop somebody from saying, you know what, I have this information, but uh, I don't have the time to put it up there. If it's easy to put it up there, they're more likely to put it up there. So I'm going to switch over to the wiki just to show what that looks like. So this is established on the Fuse Wiki uh, as a collection of pages there. So this is a landing page um, that gives links out to a number of the other Wiki pages. And I'm just going to show you the FAQ page in particular, where we have oodles of questions. So question, answer question, answer, question, answer, just all sorts of questions. Any question that's basically been asked that multiple people have asked has been put up here, and it gets added to all the time. The, the biggest one here is when is SEND mandatory, because uh, this is something that everybody was asking. The guidelines were confusing. Uh, there were multiple dates given out uh, by various sources, and so kind of at least some level of here's what everybody thinks it's going to be uh, put up here is very valuable to people. Let me switch back to the forum, or sorry, to the presenter. All right. Next, the forum. So the this being the active discussion outlet, um, some place for people to actually be able to um, put up questions and have them be answered in relatively, you know, you know, not months. Uh, there were a couple forums out there that previously existed, but they were clearly dead. Uh, you know, where the last question was asked in uh, 2007. And so, you know, somebody coming to that page would obviously say, I'm not going to get my question answered. Uh, let's go seek alternative means. So here we needed a some form. Uh, we looked at a couple different outlets. Uh, Exedus form uh, didn't really have the control we wanted. Here, because the wiki was on the Fuse wiki, it, it made sense to have the form be at least hosted by Fuse or, or somewhere available so that, you know, people only have to log in once. They can link freely, freely between the two. Uh, so we engaged the uh, Fuse uh, experts, and we went through a couple iterations. They tried uh, setting up a, a forum uh, sub-page type thing, um, but what we ended up with was Discus. So Discus is the engine that drives a lot of the comment pages you see all around the world. Um, you'll notice, based on the look of it, that once you notice, once you recognize it, you'll start seeing it in a lot of different websites. And the key here is that it can be added to any page. Discus manages the data, but um, it can be served up on this page. Uh, here, we added it to, the, to a wiki page we just called Forum, and it just happens to have this Discus on it. But really, anybody uh, using the Fuse Wiki could put a Discus form uh, on their page. It's, it's very easy to add. Um, so the next piece was uh, moderation. So a forum's nothing without the experts to actually answer the questions. Fortunately speaking, we have a lot of dedicated volunteers who are interested in answering these questions, um, not only to uh, uh, perhaps stem the tide of questions that they would get to their emails, uh, but a 
point people to. Um, it also has you know a number of things like up down votes, being able to track a conversation, just great. I'm going to flip over to that and show some of the show what it looks like. So here's the discus piece. You saw that little spinning bubble. Uh, that's where discus takes over. And you just see a number of comments where somebody asks a question, people reply to it, and can reply ad nauseum. So as you can see, it's had a had some use out of it, which is very nice. I'll switch back to the presentation. So next was giving getting the word out. Um, so oops, sorry. So just to go over some of the the ways that we've tried to uh, let people know that this exists. Uh, the very biggest one is email blasts, basically emailing all the send uh, uh, email distribution lists, everybody, uh, have, getting in touch with the vendors so that uh, of, of products so that they could, you know, say their own style on it to say, hey, go here for some information, get people, you know, knowledgeable about send. Um, to the extent core team, um, who are the people who generally have to answer questions or, or and that sort of thing. Um, Fuse, like we're doing today. Uh, to let people know that it, it exists out there and can be used as a resource uh, for implementers of SEND. And then additional avenues, all ranging from CDIS, SOT, ACT, IQ, and so on. And then here, um, now that you've heard me talk, uh, pass on the word, uh, use it. It's, it's out there, and people are moderating it. So here are the links, um, just to, just an overview. Uh, the forum is a place to ask SEND questions, and the wiki is a place to get uh, all sorts of questions that have already been answered uh, to look up um, on your own time. And then if you have any questions, contact me. Uh, I had the group up. Even though the group's primary focus has been completed, uh, we, you know, as the moderation is still concerned, we still meet uh, semi-regularly to discuss the forum and, and so on. All right, I will now pass it back to Scott. Thank you so much, Troy. That, that is excellent work. Um, the non-clinical working group. I hope that really does help to get the word out. Just looking at uh, some of the responses on your forum, it seems like it's a very active community there. So if people do have questions, it's an excellent resource um, for people to leverage. So for our final uh, topic-related presentation today, I'm going to turn, the, turn it over to Jeff Lowe to talk about representation of a protocol in RDF. And well, Jeff boots up his presentation, I'll just give him a brief introduction. Jeff is a lead systems architect within the Metadata Labs group in the research and development of Metadata Solutions. He has worked on two projects in the Semantic Technologies CSS Working Group and is co-chairing the Trends and Technologies stream at the annual Fuse Conference in London coming up in October. So with that introduction, um, the floor is yours, Jeff. Thanks very much, Scott. Um, I'm here to talk to you today about some of the work that we've been doing within the Few Semantic Technologies Group. Um, uh, I'm here, obviously. Frederick Malfay, who basically put together most of these slides, but um, is in a plane as we speak, um, it was obviously very important to the production of this uh, event, and uh, that's why I'm acknowledging him on the front page. So what we're going to talk about today is uh, trying to work out what the reason for being for a lot of the semantic technology work is uh, that we've been doing. So we're going to start off by looking at the difference between uh, CS standards and W3C standards. Um, whereabouts are some opportunities for us as a as an industry to be able to to, to leverage um, some of this power that is out there and, and take it forward. Um, we talk about some of the work that we've actually done within the semantic technology working group itself. Uh, we're going to take a look at the one particular project, which is the Protocol of Study Design Model in IDF, and um, I'm obviously not presenting this one on behalf of Hoffman Roche, but uh, just a, a demonstration of, of how they were able to, to take a, a pilot project using this um, study design model um, and effectively round trip it. Okay, so CDIS standards making W3C standards. So if we look back to um, CDIS mission, uh, which is shown on the screen here. So uh, they're intending to develop and support global platform independent data standards that improve, that enable information system interoperability to improve medical research. The most important uh, three words are improve medical research, but also sort of one of the main facilitating um, uh, 
capabilities is, the, is um, using uh, or developing interoperability using uh, independent data standards. And so we're all aware of the CETA data standards. Um, we've all seen them. We've all had great fun wading our way through a number of PDFs and, if we're lucky, an Excel spreadsheet to try and get out the information that we want. Um, and this is the sort of stuff that we need to use to actually start putting this stuff into practice, take it from a, from a model into an implementation. And the CETA standards themselves, well, they're not ba actually based on a formal model for a start. Um, so we don't get the power of uh, any sort of modeling technology behind it. Um, they're not generally available in any sort of standard format. Um, we get the PDFs themselves, um, which leads on to the next point, uh, which are not all that machine readable. Um, and certainly in my experience, it's been quite challenging to take a lot of those tables that are in the CDS uh, standards, extract the information out, and then be able to process it using uh, an electronic system. They don't directly support any semantic interoperability, so we know we have CDASH, we know we have SD, SDTM, and we know there's a link between the two. Um, one gets the other, obviously, but there's no sort of electronic representation of that. You have to go and find another user guide, which again is not something that a machine can process. It's something that uh, someone has to read, uh, interpret, and understand. And obviously, this means that they're generally disconnected. Whereas the W3 semantic standards are in fact based on a form model. Um, they use a sort of a standard format and language that everybody uh, shares and understands. Um, and they are machine readable, obviously, uh, and they directly support semantic interoperability. The, the whole linked data, which I'm sure you've seen the linked open data cloud in many of these presentations, just show the, the, the vast network that's, an avail that's available and how these things can all be joined together to to, to build up this massive web of knowledge. So I'm going to talk now about the actual uh, CSS uh, semantic technology working group itself and what we've been doing. So uh, we had a, a good couple of, uh, a very productive last year in terms of the actual first part of the project, which was which was realistic and timely, was the HD to be able to represent the CDS foundational standards using the RDF. Um, we successfully managed to do this for the sort of the four core standards and the control terminology. We also published these idea files um, to GitHub, and it would have been around nearly this time last year that we did that. Uh, we've presented, we've put together a draft user's guide. Um, there's been some internal review by the CDS XML Technologies Group, and we're hoping to put it out for a public review very soon. Uh, the next one is what we're going to focus on today, but we, we, we decided to move on to the next models, the, and I'll talk about this in a second. Um, so we're going to, we, we've done all the, if you will, the, the low-hanging fruit with C-STTM, et cetera, um, and we want to be able to take the web further. There are also other groups uh, that are working. Um, I can't speak to a great deal to the representation analysis themselves metadata, but they're, they're having some very productive conversations. I'm not part of that one, but I am part of the key CRF, which is uh, using some underlying semantic technologies to be able to uh, facilitate the easy transfer of information um, between uh, uh, electronic record systems and uh, CDASH in this particular case, obviously with the end goal, be able to put it into your EDC system moving forward. So the protocol and state design model and RDF. Well, we originally started off and said we were going to do the protocol representation model in RDF. Um, and that was, I looked at it and I said, this is going to be sort of a huge ask because there's a lot of lot of information in that specification. You would end up, uh, you could end up tying yourself in knots. So uh, I suggested and that the team kind of basically agreed that let's focus on something that everybody can get their teeth into and everybody understands, which is the schedule activities. Um, it's going to be a common item just about all the protocols themselves. Everybody understands it. Everybody can take it from a, a really abstract concept into something that's really practical and something they see in their day-to-day -day job. Because ultimately, we want to produce something that people can get their get their teeth into and use. So we decided to focus on the the shear activities. Um, to do that, we needed to build up a model um, to represent the concepts in here. Um, and as it turned out, we didn't kind of need to because a lot of that work had been done previously by the XML Technologies team with the study design model. Uh, representation XML. 
that covered the, the core elements that you can imagine seeing in that group in terms of we talk about our structural elements, the, the bits, the sort of the building blocks that put everything together, the workflow which tells you in which order um, things happen and how to make transitions from one um, structural element to the next, and then timing allowing us to, to be prescriptive as and when uh, things happen um, when we actually implement this protocol. Now, so this is actually quite an interesting standard because it, it bridges the gap between the PRM and it uses the underlying ODM model, but there's also components of workflow built into that because a lot of the, the architects of it wanted to, to actually get to the point where they could deliver something uh, originating in the PRM and going into a, a, an electronic scheduling system within a hospital. Um, so there's a lot of workflow. Workflow is a really important part of that, which is really quite interesting. And as we worked on it, um, we had problems because things just didn't quite mesh up at how we kind of imagined them. So we went away, we, we kind of evolved our approach to this in terms of what we said, rather than, okay, let's reproduce a faithful representation of uh, the STM itself. And um, let's see if we can get something that, that covers our, our purposes, but still allows us to get the, the STM out. And so that's what we've called sort of the, uh, the line of sight, i.e. It, it'll decompose down, it'll use concepts that can be decomposed down to the core STM, because then we get kind of a, a, dual, a dual approach. You develop a model that works for us, but it's also, there's also the ability to extract um, X amount out that uh, people who have built tools around the SDM can use. And the other thing was we've had a very good discussion with some of the, the architects of the SDM. Um, and so there's been a lot of sort of touring and forming about exactly what decisions were made and why they were made. And there's also been sort of a, a dialogue about, okay, well, these, these are places where we had difficulty. Um, what do you think about this approach to try and get around that? So the whole intent of this is to um, once we've got this uh, this model done and dusted, then we'll be having a meeting with uh, the XML technologies team to, to talk about some of our findings and hopefully to augment the STM um, for the next generation. So to look at some of the model itself, um, uh, there's a couple of screenshots out of one of the tools that we're using. So you can instantly start seeing elements that look familiar to you. So we've got at the top here, this, um, for those people who are unfamiliar, this STM is a, a namespace, which means that this is uh, where the, the concept itself is defined. So we have our protocol, as you, you might imagine. And we also say, okay, we have a concept of a protocol, but we want to be more specific than, in, of that in terms of we're going to say that we have the particular version of a protocol. And this gives us, as part of the model, the ability to version it, um, to make changes, and to track changes itself. Uh, the schedule itself uh, is, is the, sort of the period for all these other things. We have um, uh, epochs obviously defined because uh, we need to be able to put that in out at the end of the day as part of our trial design um, uh, models. Um, we also have a concept of our arm. And then we tie, basically the, we tie arms to epochs in our sort of grid arrangement um, using cells. Um, there's also a concept um, used in the SDM for the segment, which we, we chose not to focus on because we didn't find it kind of met our purposes. And this is where it starts to get really interesting. Um, the, the core of the SDM was around this, uh, a concept of an activity, which is essentially, a, if you think about it, kind of a, a pivot point or a description of a pivot point itself. Um, so we had these sort of different specializations of activities, and there was there's a component of, the, of this that actually came from some of the bridge work. Um, so some of these terms may seem familiar to you. But uh, at the very high level, we have a sort of a concept of an activity, which is just a generic um, activity type concept. We have a study activity, which is kind of a, a specialization of an activity within a study. So for example, an, an example of a sort of study activity would be uh, ECG, taking an ECG. Um, and then a planned activity is a specialization of that in terms of we will say we have we want to take an ECG, but we want to take it at a particular time, um, or we have it associated with a particular study event as shown here. Um, and then of course there's a link to a segment here as well. The the one where I think it starts to get really interesting is this concept of a defined activity. Now defined activity could be something you've defined up in front. So that would be something that sits in your global library. Um, and so in doing and linking everything together by the 
by the IDF concepts, you have the ability to put a lot of sort of study metadata um, or pull in a lot of study metadata without actually having to be specifically defining it because we can define it in our global library as part of our defined activity and by instantiating or creating the study activity inheriting from the defined activity, we automatically pull everything else in. So I think that's really fascinating. I think it's going to provide a lot of value for people using the model. We also have to take account of uh, time, timing, obviously. So we can break this down. A lot of the time point granularity and, and timing types are already defined in the STM. So we, we just uh, essentially faithfully uh, reproduce them. Um, we use, uh, as and when possible, the um, ISO 8601 uh, time representations as much as possible. Because we want to try and make, as I said, we want to keep a line of sight. So we didn't want to go too far off the reservation. Um, and everybody's familiar with these and everybody's happy with using it. So let's just roll with it. I think it's a perfect concept to do what we need it to do. So then you can start seeing how every, all this thing starts coming together. So we have this very top level element, which is a study design element. And then we have our activities, which are all um, can be specialized into defined activities, main activities, or study activities. And this is this gets really interesting because we can start defining required or properties on an activity and then uh, because these are all sort of uh, uh, specializations of this, this uh, the, you can, the concept we define on this parent and can also apply on all the children as well. You can see the other um, obvious things like ARM and EPOP are shown there. We, we don't talk about it today, but it's also associated with a protocol element are parameters which will go into our uh, trial design things such as um, names of ARMs or how much drug is given. Um, so we, we also have these accounted for in our model. Um, and we've also sort of taken one step further from the original SDM in terms of being able to say, okay, we want to produce a, a group of parameters or which are associated with another particular study design element. So we want to say, for example, we could find a high dose and then we can associate, we can put parameter values associated with a particular high, high dose arm. And we can link all this stuff together, which is pretty cool. So this is an example of a, uh, a a real study itself, taking all of these concepts and just sticking real data into it. Because one of the things once we we did once we did our first pass is we we put it all together and then we just spent a couple of weeks just looking at it and, and coming up and thinking up of ways where it wouldn't quite fit. Um, and this was really important to me and it was important to the rest of the team because there's very little value in delivering a model which we know doesn't work. So one of the most important things we did was actually got people to try and take protocols that they had access to and, and, and insert their the protocol metadata into that and see if there was any places where it didn't fit. And as an example, the, the parameter groups came from, from Amy who, who tried to, to model a parameter, but it just didn't work. There was no way to be able to draw in that association. So this was a really important part, making sure that the model that we're delivering is a model that people can use. So you can see here we have a study activity of heart rate and then we have a, a planned activity of heart rate at screening. Um, the, heart, the planned activity is associated with a particular cell and that cell is associated with a particular epoch. So you can start seeing how we're drawing all of these links together, building up something that's really solid and can re adequately represent everything that we want to be, be able to represent of the model. Um, but do it in such a way as you can have it in a machine readable um, and processable format. So moving forward, um, we've essentially uh, uh, produced an alpha release of the uh, studio activities work. Um, and that's kind of getting polished off. A lot of the uh, the drivers have been from a few members of the team who one Frederick is obviously one, but his day job is, is not giving him enough time to focus on, on actually moving it forward. So what we do is we've got a uh, sort of an alpha or beta version of the model and we're just still trying it out to make sure it all works. Um, but we want to be able to take um, our existing model and add more stuff into it to add value to it. So we've, we've already defined a concept of a protocol, or a protocol concept and create an instance of a protocol concept. Well, if we can create that concept, we can start hanging other things off it. So uh, inclusion exclusion criteria already covered, of course, as part of the, um, the existing protocol element. But we can start actually building out an entire protocol representation in much the same way as what we did with um, the, the C-CTM standards. Um, 
we're also looking at the actually finalising the, the study design itself um, to be able to standardise it using a, a sort of a good underlying model. Because once we have a good underlying model, people can build tools on top of it. Um, and I think that's the most important part to have the the, the core concepts agreed and defined um, in such a way that the people understand what you're talking about when you mention a particular concept and when you try and use it. So then they can they can just click and say, yes, this is what I want, and this is how I can use it. Let's move forward with that. Um, and we want to be able to, of course, make it, take advantage of the fact that, uh, say, for example, we've, we've defined a, a study activity, which is an instantiation of a, pl of a planned activity. Um, well, uh, the activities themselves could be associated with a CRF or another train CRF. So you could have your EDC system. Uh, you could find an activity in your your uh, data center repository, and then you want to pull it into your schedule of activities, and then you, just, you get to the point where you can just push a button, and it will go away and pull in all the, the bits and pieces you need to be able to, to do to build a, uh, um, a schedule for importing into your EDC system, and you, you can just take it and run with it. And as I said, because we've got uh, we're developing a, a good standard model for the whole entire protocol, um, then we can actually start looking at some tools around that to facilitate things like structured authoring, authoring building up template libraries for particular therapeutic areas, or particular phases. Um, most important thing, obviously, is to have a good model and a good understanding of the concepts that are there. And that's the path that we're on. That's the path that we're going to continue to follow. And then there's topic maps, which are, I'm not completely au fait with them, but uh, I think the, the general concept is you can define uh, a particular document as a series of RDF um, sections and you can link them together so you can have like a chapter and a section and everything like that. Um, but each of these particular elements themselves are RDF um, uh, concepts or RDF instantiations. So you can actually start having these things just self-assembled from um, the bits that you've put, you've defined with your model. So people who we've worked with over the, the period of this time with the structured protocol model, um, obviously the protocol representation group. Um, one of the things that came out from the CSS was an understanding that there were a lot of people trying to do similar sort of stuff here. Um, obviously, HL7 had their study design structured document. Um, Spirit uh, had worked on sort of standardizing some of the protocol design concepts. Um, and of course, Transcelerator are focusing now on building up a standard protocol template. Um, and of course, the protocol representation group just never went anywhere. Um, it's just still there, and we, we're still using it. So what we've done is uh, we've used this as an opportunity to take a lot of our um, expertise within the each individual groups and then uh, go and help out as when we can. So we have a representative on the inside of the Transcelerate group. Um, there's been some conversations with the Spirit group via the uh, protocol representation group. We're actually turning up to the protocol representation group every month people from our team and actually representing a lot of the concepts that we've been working on and developing and making sure those are available for people. Um, and this is, I'm just going to talk about this very briefly, but one of the most important things to actually get money for any sort of project is to prove it works. Um, so come up with a, a proof of concept, uh, chuck, uh, put it together and, and sit in front of important people and show, that, show them that they can sit it's something that they can see and something they can understand and see if they can, something they can see working. So this is something that uh, Roche did um, end of last year, I believe. They wanted to be able to prove the fact that there was actually value in representing um, a protocol as an example, or she directed it as an example, and using RDF in terms of delivering real value to the, the organization as a whole. Uh, Roche have been very busy in terms of building up a, a really good quality um, in their repository. Um, and this is, this is essentially their um, equivalent of the, the Re3C layer cake, or maybe in this case it's a Swiss roll. But um, the whole concept, uh, we, we start from the, from the base and work our way up, getting, uh, using essentially iterating on uh, each of these different layers to give more and more power to your model. So we're starting off with, a, with our, the RDF, our and SCOS, to be able to categorize and pull together all our uh, representative relationships between each of our different um, concepts and actually 
uh, tie them together and then have the method that uses the ICO 11179 to actually manage workflow, manage life cycle of these different elements. Incorporate obviously the CEDA standards, which we, we can do because we've already done that as part of FUSE, um, applies to the work boundary extensions. And then on top of that, they have um, some HTTP REST application services which allow people to uh, access the, the components of the MDR without actually having to know too much about them. And so, as I said, this about this time last year, or in, towards the end of the year last year, they did an example where they took an exist, uh, a sheet of assessments um, and they modelled it much more manually, of course, because a lot of the, um, the the elements themselves weren't completely thought out at that point, uh, represented it um, in the tool, imported it into an RDF store, and then showed via a web service the reproduction of that grid. So there's the value right there. You can say, you can instantly see this matches this, um, but not only does this match this, there's a lot more information associated with this in terms of a lot of these activities are linked to real concepts within your data standards repository. Um, and you can really get a massive bang for your buck out of that. So thank you very much. Great. Thanks so much, Jeff, for walking us through that. Again, more important work being done um, by the Semantic Technologies group. So at this point, I just want to remind people that if you do have questions for any of our panelists, um, please feel free to type them into either the chat box or the uh, question functionality in the GoToWebinar control panel. And at this point, I'm going to turn it back over to Chris for some closing remarks. And then we'll take uh, any questions that we haven't received. Hi, everyone. Scott, just wanted to confirm you can hear me and see me. Yes, we can. Okay, great. I'm just going to wrap up really quickly with some closing remarks. Um, a lot of work is going on, as you saw from the previous uh, presentations that our speakers made today. Uh, if you want to get involved, there's a lot of activities going on across all of the working groups that I talked about earlier uh, in the uh, presentation in the webinar. Uh, if you go to a few of our websites, um, we have a list of the dashboard of projects going on now, uh, as well as a list of, uh, of deliverables that have been, or a catalog of deliverables that have been produced. So if I actually, I'm going to jump out here for a second and go over to that. And I'll just show you this very quickly. I won't, I won't uh, stay on it too long. But this is a list of the projects that are going on right now within each working group. So again, the working group itself is an overall uh, concept of that area, and then there's a lot of projects that are going on within those, um, those groups, uh, as you can tell from this, this website. Uh, in addition, there's a catalog of deliverables uh, that are out here. So these are um, a list of the things over the last few years that have been delivered as part of the working group and project efforts. So you can go here, there's some white papers, the reviewer guides, which were presented today, the implementation wiki, sent for send, and other, other deliverables. Um, so this will give you an opportunity to sort of drill into those and see the information and the things that the, all these teams have really been working hard to deliver and provide value. Let me go back to my presentation really quickly. Um, if you're interested in signing up or getting involved in a working group, you can go to a link on our Fuse wiki. Uh, where it'll have uh, an email and list box instructions for how to actually get, get involved. Um, one of the things I do want to highlight today is our Emerging Technologies or Emerging Trends Working Group. So this is a group that was initiated actually on the idea of Lillian Rosario from the FDA at our second meeting in 2013 where I, she said instead of always focusing on the working groups on you know, the challenges or the gaps that we're facing, let's look at some of the new technologies or new processes or ideas that we could start to talk about. And so we started that group and the first meeting was all about uh, generating new ideas and brainstorming interests. And out of that came uh, a number of projects that were worked on, the semantics technologies, the standardization of metadata definitions, and lowering barriers of, of cloud technology. And one of the neat things that came out of that group was that the semantic technologies, for example, um, it, it kind of, a lot of ideas came out of that group and, or out of that project, and it ended up forming many projects or many groups um, so that, that that semantic technologies actually is broken in now into its own working group 
uh, and it has four or five projects as Jeff just alluded to when he was going through that. So it was an idea that was generated and it turned into a, a number of um, established projects with objectives. So we're really looking uh, as we as we move into the rest of this year and the and the meeting coming up next May, we're looking for new ideas and people to join this emerging trends and technologies group and to start to kickstart some new ideas. Um, ideas that were thrown around in the last year were things around big data, transparency, and whatever your ideas might be in terms of contributing to this. Uh, but this group is looking for uh, new ideas and some people to help with generating these these um, new concepts and, and maybe rolling them into projects and, and seeing what happens. Um, so you can contact me, that's my email at the, at the bottom, chris.decker at fuse.eu, uh, and I'll be more than happy to kind of connect you with the folks in that group and, and move that forward. Um, so I just wanted to put a plug in for that, for that one group. What's coming up? Well, we have our working groups continue to meet, continue to work on activities. Uh, but we do have our meeting coming up in 2015 in March. Uh, it'll be 14th, 17th of March. Uh, it's in Silver Spring, Maryland again. Uh, and we will be opening registration for that event in the very beginning of November. Um, there are a number of meeting activities similar to the previous meetings. We'll have an FDA session uh, that will kick off the meeting to discuss a variety of topics, which might include the, the new guidance. Um, the FDA repository and other other topics and things that are going on within the within the FDA and how it relates to to us in the industry. Uh, we'll have having the working groups as we normally do, uh, which will take up probably about half of the meeting. We'll have the working groups meet and and work on the things that they're they've been uh, they've been working on throughout the year, and we'll have the normal posters and an FDA panel at the end of the meeting. Uh, where we'll be able to ask questions and, and have a discussion over various topics. So I'd encourage you, uh, this, this event is limited to uh, no more than 300 people due to the, the facilities we have at the moment. So I'd, I'd recommend that you, um, um, you know, sign up early for this event when it comes out in November. And Scott, that's all I have uh, in terms of wrapping up. So again, I thank the presenters today. Um, and I hope uh, I hope others who have, are not involved currently with with working groups or projects to get involved and see how you can contribute to these uh, activities that are going on. So I'll hand it back to uh, to Scott now. Great, thank you so much, Chris, for for that wrap up. So we do have uh, a few questions. So the first is uh, for Susan. Can you please uh, reiterate when the updated uh, ADRG work package will be posted to the Fuse Wiki? Uh, yes, well, thank you, Scott, and thank you for the question. Um, I don't have a precise date, but I'll I'll go out on a limb and say within the next month. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, and then just uh, one for Troy and then one for Chris. Troy, how frequently is the uh, SEND implementation forum monitored? Uh, well, it's whenever people get to it. Uh, the forum can be subscribed to, uh, so any of the people who are moderating it, the experts, uh, get email notifications as and when the topics come through. Um, based on the last several, uh, the answers come within an hour to a few hours, usually. Excellent. And then, uh, Chris, I thought one of the people was really impressed with, with the Troy had put together with the, that not that working group put together for an implementation wiki and forum. Is there ever any thought to doing the same for SETM or Atom within the context of the CSS? Um, that's something that we probably would would want to sit down and have a conversation with CDIS. CDIS already has a number of forums um, uh, available for this, so we fuse uh, has a relationship and, and agreement with CDESC and we talk frequently on how we can make sure we leverage each other's uh, uh, objectives and move forward on that so that's a great idea and I can definitely uh, we'll work with the fuse steering committee to follow up with CDESC and make that a topic of discussion as to where we can capture that type of information perfect those are all the questions that came through. So again, I'd like to thank those that had joined the webinar for their time today, and especially for those who have taken time to present and uh, bring the information to us. So thank you, everybody, for your time. The webinar recording will be posted on 
uh, please IEU and we'll send out a message when that gets done. So thank you very much.